This week we're talking about the DOM and DOM programming and earlier I did a video where we were talking about finding things in the DOM and updating the DOM, creating new elements and today in this video what I want to do is I want to focus on the second half of those notes and specifically think about um, events, DOM events and how they work. So again I would encourage you to read the notes, week 7 notes, and I want to I want to try and code a few examples and show you how these things work and, and just talk to you about it. So the major concept here that we're talking about is the fact that the web in particular and JavaScript are event driven programming languages. So where you're used to perhaps working in a language like C, where you are very much in charge, you write a main entry point for your program and main calls function one, function two, function three, and then it exits. That is not the model of the web. The web is an environment where the browser is in control, the user is in control, the operating system is in control, and your program supplies a series of event handlers and functions that are going to be run at some point. So we're not as in control of when things happen, or we don't lay out uh, the main loop where everything takes place. So there is a main loop. Um, you're used to, you know, if you think about a video game or if you've ever written, uh, maybe you've had the, the problem in, in your programs where you've written an infinite loop and your program runs forever. Well, uh, you know, most programs are essentially an infinite loop. They're a loop that goes on and processes input from the user, processes uh, various events and interrupts and so on from the system and just does this over and over and over again in order to update state and re-render whatever's going on. The browser is no different. The browser is constantly running. You don't really see the loop. It looks like nothing's happening. I mean, the page seems to be sitting still, but as we learned in the discussion about the DOM, we can be doing lots and lots of things in code as we're working. So one of the metaphors that we have in the notes this week is this idea of um, working on programming with an event-driven system being a lot like thinking about working with lights. Like if you think about, I have an image here. If you think about how a light switch works, we have a light switch and we have a light fixture or a light bulb. And the two of those things don't have to know about each other. In other words, if I'm building a house, I can install a light switch, somebody uh, manufactures the light switch and it has no knowledge of the light fixture that it's going to be used with. You can go and you can buy any light fixture you want or a single bulb and you can wire those together. So the two endpoints, the bulb and the light switch, don't have they don't have any knowledge of each other and they don't need to have knowledge of each other. They aren't designed so that they have to fit tightly together. What we do instead is we wire them together at the point where we decide we want to connect one to the other so that flipping on the light switch is going to have the effect that the light turns on or off. So really, that's very much what we're going to be doing when we talk about doing event-driven programming. We're going to have a series of events. These are These are things that are going to take place in the browser, and they could be... Uh, in response to the user doing something, the user is going to click, or it could be in response to the network, the network's going to download something, it could be a sensor, maybe it's a camera, or a microphone, or um, geolocation information from a GPS, all sorts of things are going to trigger various sorts of events in the system, and when that happens, we want to be able to insert listeners or insert functions that we want to run at the point where that event takes place. Okay, so this is this is the idea of of what we're going to be doing. And there's a couple of different ways that we can we can work with these in the DOM. So as we were talking about last time, we need to have elements in order to be able to do any of our work. So previously we talked about, for example, using something like document.body or uh, document.query selector in order to select an image or a paragraph or whatever sort of uh, DOM element we want to work with. Once we have a reference to a DOM element, we have two ways that we can add an event. So first of all, an event has a name. So a simple example of an event name would be click or double click or load or error. So there's all these strings that represent different sorts of events that we can work with. And in a few minutes, I'm gonna show you examples of these. 
And you can see in the page here that we have two ways that we can register an event listener. So an event is a name, like in this case, I just have the word event and event, but imagine that said click or um, load. So this is just the name of the event. The event handler or the event listener is a function. It's some piece of code that we want to run in response to that event taking place. So I want you to notice the two methods that we have here for working with events. The first one allows us to register a function that's going to be fired whenever this event happens in the browser and it's gonna happen on this element. So it could be, for example, that when the user clicks on a button, we want to have a button click event and the button click event needs to make this particular function take place. The second one is that we use a method called add event listener. And I want you to notice the difference between the two of these. In the second case, when we specify the event, we do it as the first argument to add event listener and we don't include the prefix on. So if the event is named click, you would say add event listener click. However, if you're doing it with the first method, you have to say on click. And also I want you to notice that unlike everywhere else you're gonna see in JavaScript, where we typically use camel case, such that the second letter would be capitalized, the third, like the next word would be capitalized as we go along in a variable name. In this case, we don't. We leave the event name all lowercase, as you see here. Okay, so why would I choose one over the other? The principal difference between the two of these is that if I use the first method and I say that I want to register an event listener for this event on this element, I can only have one of these values that is happening at a time. I can only have one function that's gonna handle this. In the second case, I'm literally going to add, so I'm going to add another function as an event listener meaning I could have two, three, four, five, as many as I want. They can all happen together and it's not gonna cause a problem. Adding another one won't overwrite a previous one, okay? So if you take a look at this little piece of code down here, you can see that we have a reference to the body element and then we define two functions, handle click and handle click two. So if you take a look at this code here, body.onClick equals handle click, what that's going to do is it's going to take this function and it's going to attach it to the event, the click event on the body, so that whenever the body gets clicked, it's going to fire off this function. In the next line, it says body.onClick handle click two. And what's going to happen there is that handle click two is going to get registered for the click event on the body. However, it's going to overwrite the previous one. So it'll be as if we never did that one. So you can only have one of these at a time if you do it in this, in this way. However, if we go and we do the second method and we use add event listener, you can see that we're able to register for the click event on the body twice and we can set it up so both of these, um, both of these will, get, will get registered. All right, so I think what I wanna do is I'm gonna, I'm gonna switch to writing some code. So I'll let you work through these notes and you can read about various things, but I think it's gonna be easier for me to show you some things as they happen and we can talk about, I'll show you some examples of events and different ways of registering them and so on. So I've got a, I've got a web page set up and I've got my editor here and uh, I've got a basic web page and I'll just take you through what's here so that we can start writing code against it. Um, there's very little in the page. However, uh, one thing that I've imported is I have created a script file called hounds.js, which is an array of URLs, strings to images of dogs. I was able to get this from the dog API. The dog API is a API that um, is useful because it allows you to get all sorts of, well, <laughs> dogs, uh, dog images. So people use it for machine learning and just for examples, I often use it in examples. So here's a thousand URLs of um, hounds that I can work with in our page. So I wanna use this list 
inside of our HTML to do a few things, just so that we can uh, make our page do a little bit. And you can see that I'm loading that script down here at the bottom of my page, so it's already there. Okay, so here's what our page looks like to begin with. So the very first thing that I wanna show you is I want to, uh, I'll throw another script block in here. I wanna register an event handler so that I know when the page has loaded. And all I'm gonna do is I'm going to log to the console and say that the page, the page is loaded. So I'll save this, it'll reload, and you can see down here in my console, I have a window.onload event. So lots of things in the DOM have load events telling us that this, this element has loaded. So for example, we also have an image here. We have an image that's being loaded, a dog that's being loaded. This is the URL. We could do the same thing with this image. So I could say document dot query selector. And if I want to get this image, I can use the ID, which is dog. And so I can say dog and I can attach an event handler to the, to the load event of uh, this element by saying on load equals function console.log like so. Save this and you'll see now my page looks like the following. You can see that the onload event happened for the dog and that happened before the onload event of the window, which is interesting. So we'll come back to this. So let's write another event handler for the dog. Let's write an error event handler. And I'm gonna say console.error dog image error. Okay, and I'll rerun this. Now right now there isn't an error. So it's loading my my dog and so the only function that's being called is the load event handler. So this is one of the interesting things about working with event handlers is that you're going to write lots of code for situations that may or may not happen. You're going to have lots of cases in your web page where something could take place. The user may do this or the data may go this way or the network may do this or that something errors, something breaks. But in this case, nothing is breaking for me. Okay, so um, could I break this? Well, what if I what if I had an error in my URL? So what if I got rid of the G in JPEG and I reloaded this? So now something different happens. Now there's a 404 when it tries to load my image because it can't, the dog isn't there. And it comes and it writes to the console and says that there was an error. And you notice that my load event hasn't fired on the dog element. So I've reversed which of the two is actually taking place. Let's modify this and change it around a little bit. So one of the changes that I'm going to make is I'm going to move this code to another place in my file. So sometimes you'll see people put scripts up in the top of their page, which I don't recommend. And I'll show you why. So I'm going to run this and you see that I have an error. So it says type error cannot set property on load of null. And if we click on this, we can jump into the debugger and we can see that dog is undefined. So I'm going to put a breakpoint right here and I'm going to reload my page and I'm going to hover over this because that doesn't make any sense. Why would dog not exist? A minute ago it existed, but now it doesn't exist. Well, one of the other things that these event listeners can help us with is they can help us with timing bugs, bugs that are related to doing something that's correct, but it's not, it's not being done at the correct time. So in the code that you see right here, the problem is that 
this page is being loaded, the script is being parsed and run, and when it's run, and it says document.querySelectorDog, the element that it needs in the DOM has not been created yet. So what we need is we need a way to say, I want to only run this code once that element exists. How do we know when the element exists? Well, we can use events for this. So if I were to take this code here, and if I moved this inside of my onload, if I move it inside of the onload event handler, and if I save this, let's let this run. Now you can see that it's working. So the reason that it works is that it's not going to run this code when it encounters the code. So it's not going to run the code immediately. It's going to run the code only when the window has fully loaded. Okay. Now I can move this code anywhere I want in the file and it'll be fine. So I'm going to move it back down here. It isn't going to hurt that it's inside of an event handler. In fact, it's a good idea. So what I would encourage you to do is make sure that any of the code that you're going to write that depends upon the page being loaded, or if it depends upon the content existing, that you do it this way. Another common way you'll see see this done is using the DOM content loaded. Let me just rewrite this code and then I'll show you what I'm doing here. So another thing that people will do is they will say, I, a minute ago we had window.onload equals function like so. So here I'm using the second method and I'm, I'm showing you the second method, which is I'm adding an event listener and the event that I'm going to listen for is called DOM content loaded. So the DOM content loaded event, in fact, why don't I do this so I can demonstrate what I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to register a load event handler, and I'm also going to register a DOM content loaded event handler. So I'm going to go back to the console, and what you'll see is the following. You can see that the DOM content loaded event fired earlier than the image on load event, and the image on load event fired earlier than the window dot on load event. Okay. So what's happening here is DOM content loaded means that the DOM has been set up. All of the content of the DOM exists. So if you need to uh, query the DOM for a particular element in the DOM, you know that the DOM is there. So that's, that's what's happening here. And the load events tell you that this resource has finished loading. So this dog image has finished loading. And window.onload means the DOM has been parsed, it's been created, and all of the resources that are needed by this page have also been created. So on load, window.onload could happen, it could take quite a while to happen if you've got lots of images and style sheets and different things that are loading. So if you want a really, you know, if you want a, a clean way to say, don't do this until the page is ready, this is my recommendation to add an event listener. And you'll see sometimes people will just write add event listener. They'll do that because remember that window is the global. So anything that exists on the global, you can just do, I could just say add event listener and then it will do all of these steps here like so. Okay. So load events, error events, really, really helpful when you're trying to, um, when you're trying to understand what's going on, why something isn't working, or if you have something that's, that is ordered or something that could fail sometimes and it doesn't fail other times. All of these things, uh, they can be really, really helpful for what you're trying to do. Okay, so what, what else should we look at? Well, let's look at a user-initiated event. So the load event happens because the browser did something. What if we are interested in seeing the user do something? Okay, so I'm gonna write some more code. So I'm gonna say, 
document.body and I'm going to specify that I'm interested in an event. Now, do you notice when I say on, Visual Studio Code starts showing me all the different events that exist for this, and there's a lot of them, right? Lots and lots of these things are in here. The one that I want is click. So when the user clicks on the body, I want to know about it, and I want to I want a function to execute. So let's say console.log body clicked. Okay, so I'm going to save this. So you can see my other events have fired. I'm going to click in my browser window and I'm going to click on the body. And as I'm clicking around on the body, you can see body clicked is happening here, right? Okay, so let's modify this a little bit more. What if I wanted to specifically know if this the image of the dog had been clicked? Well, in that case, instead of using document.body, I need an I need a reference to this image element. So up here on line 24, we already we created a reference to that element so I can reuse it. So I could say dog dot on click equals function console Let's try that. So I'm going to click on the body, body clicked. Click, click, click. If I click on the dog, you'll notice that two things happen. The first is that there's a click event on the image, on the dog. And the second thing you'll notice is that there's also a body click event. So let's explain why that happens. I have an event listener on the body, which is listening for click events. And I have an event listener on the dog here, which is doing this. By the way, if you're sitting inside of, if you're in Visual Studio, uh, in this case, I'm in Chrome, um, you, can, you can see that there are click event handlers on this image. And in fact, it shows you that there are two click event handlers on this image. And if I click on the body, you'll see that there's a click event handler here and it'll take me to the line of code where, that, where that's taking place. So what's going on here? The image element is inside of the DOM tree and it's a child of the body. So deep in the body somewhere, this dog image exists. And what happens with events in the DOM is that they bubble. They bubble up, up through the DOM. So when you click on the dog. When I click on the dog, it's going to click, it's going to trigger a, or it's going to emit an event targeted at that element. But then it's also going to propagate up through the DOM to any other event handlers that exist above it. Okay, so let's let's understand a little bit more about this. So, so far when I've been writing my functions, my, my listening functions, I've just been writing a bare function. But another thing I can do is I can ask for an event object. So if you provide an argument, and you can call it whatever you want, you could call it EVT, you could call it event, you could call it E, you'll see people do all of those things. So I'll do both. I'll call this one EVT and I'll call this one E. What I'm going to do is I'm going to also log the event that happens. Okay, so I'm going to save this. So when I click on the dog, you're going to see that in both cases, the dog was clicked and the body was clicked. And what I get is I get an extra object called, in this case, a mouse event. So depending on the kind of event that you are working with, you're going to get a different kind of event. So if we open it up, you can see what's in here. There's all kinds of state information about what just happened. Which mouse button was clicked. Um, I'm going to talk about a few of these in a minute, so I'm not going to go through uh, all of them right now. But the one that I was interested in looking at for a second is this one, is the target. So one of the things that you get when you, uh, when you receive an event and you have an event listener function that fires is you're always going to get access to a target. And the target, let me show you the target down here for the body. 
So in both cases, the target is the same. So let me just modify my code. So instead of printing out the whole event, I'm gonna just print out the target. The target is the element that caused this event where the event was dispatched, so the image. Okay, so I'm gonna save this, I'm gonna click. And you can see that in both cases, the element that caused this to happen was my image. So I have two event handlers and they're sort of stacked above each other in the DOM. So how could I stop this event from going up to the body if I was only interested in having it uh, happen on the, on the dog image? So what I can do here is I could say, I wanna take the event and I wanna call, uh, let, me, let me do this. I wanna call stop propagation. Event dot stop propagation. And what that's gonna do is it's gonna stop this event from continuing on. So if I save this and I click on the dog, you'll see that I'm only getting one event now. If I click on the body, I'm getting the body. If I click on this title, for example, I'm getting the H1 element. If I click on this paragraph, I'm getting the paragraph body click, body click. But if I click on the dog, I just get this one event handler here. So event handlers start out at a, an element and they propagate up through the DOM. And it's actually a really useful technique because it means that if I have hundreds of images in a page, like think about something like Instagram or other places where you would have lots and lots of the same content, it's possible for you, instead of putting click event handlers on each one of your images, it's possible for you to put the click event handler on a parent element so that when the user clicks on an image, it will trigger, it will bubble up to the, uh, to the parent and the parent can deal with it. And the parent can always get the target element that caused this to happen, okay? So that's a trick we can use. All right, so let's, let's make our code do something a little bit more. First of all, let's try converting this code from an on-click event handler to using add event listener. So remember, what we would do is we would say dog dot add event listener. We would take the on click and we would drop the prefix on. We would turn it into a string. And that would be the first argument. The second thing we would do is we would create a function as the function is gonna be the second argument to our, to our add event listener call and we can wrap that up and close it. Now, if you don't like putting this function in line like so, you can also break it out. So I could, for example, say function handle, let me just paste this and I'll, I'll give it a name. So instead of an anonymous function, I could say handle dog click like so. And here I can use it by name, handle dog click. Okay, so both both of those are equivalent and you can choose the style that works best for you. All right, so in addition to having the, having it print to the console, let's do something else. Let's make it so that every time that they click on this dog image, it loads a new image, okay? So I wanna modify the DOM so that something new happens. I've got a thousand dog images here inside the hounds array. Okay, so let's think about this. What I need to do is in my code, I need to keep track of the current index for whichever hound image we're on. So at, at first we'll be, we'll be using zero. So let's set uh, current hound image index equals zero. And let's write a function called uh, next hound image URL. So I wanna call this function, and when I call this function, I wanna get back I wanna get back the next uh, the next item in the array. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take the current hound index and I'm gonna increase it by one. 
and I want to make sure that I haven't gone off the end of the array. So I'm going to say if the current um, if the current index is equal to the length of the array minus one, then I'm going to set it back to zero so that it'll go around. You know, if I I'm not going to go through a thousand images, but uh, I'm going to make it so that it wouldn't break if I did. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to return the current index inside of the hounds array back from the function. Okay, let's just see if that works. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna, I'm just gonna call my function next hound image URL every time the user clicks on the dog. So what I should see is I should see a URL printing here and it should be a different URL every time. Okay, that's perfect. So we have one more thing we need to do, and that is we need to set the, the URL of that image. So right now the URL of the image has been hard coded in, it's this. I wanna change it, so I'm gonna use, I'm gonna use what we know about programming the DOM. I'm gonna access the source property on my dog reference, which references this HTML image element. And I'm gonna say that it's equal to next hound image URL. And I'm just going to get rid of this console.log. I'll save this and let's see if it works. So if I click this, I should, yeah, great. So every time I do this, it's loading a new image in. If I open up my network tab, I'll just clear it so you can see what's going on. Every time I click, you're going to see it load a new image. So it's loading all these images over and over and over again, new images. Etc. So let's try something else with the mouse event. Um, previously, we were talking about the fact that we can get the uh, target of the mouse event, and um, we get that on the event object itself. But I'm interested in showing you how we could get some other data off of an event. And also, I'm interested in looking at other ways we could modify the DOM. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to um, write another event handler. I'm just trying to think where I want to put it. I guess I'll just put it at the bottom here. So every time that the body, every time the mouse moves on the body, I'm going to call the on mouse move. Uh, event, I want to I want to register a listener for this event. So every time the mouse moves on the body, I want to call this function. And what I want to do is just to begin with, I want to print it out console.log body mouse move, and I'm going to print out the event so that we can see what's happening. So if I go back to the console, you'll see lots and lots of these events. Every time I move my mouse, I'm getting different events that are firing. So if you take a look at one of these events, each one of these events is an object and it's got a bunch of properties that we can use and they all have different values. And what I'm interested in is I'm interested in the X and Y position of the mouse. So where is the mouse inside of the viewport? So I'd like to be able to print that out. So instead of printing out the EVT, I'm going to print out, let's, let's get access to EVT.ClientX and EVT.ClientY. Let's try, let's update our code and do that. So now you can see that it's keeping track of where my mouse is, like so. So in, instead of putting this in the console, what if we put it into the page? So what if, at the inside the page, we have a place h2 mouse info. And inside here, I'll do a paragraph. And inside this paragraph, what I essentially want to do is I want to say mouse position, um, you know, 100, 231, something like that. But I want these 
to update. So every time you move the mouse, I want this data here to change. What would that look like? Well, instead of having hard-coded numbers like 100, which is no, isn't correct, what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to put something in here that I can, I can put data inside. So if you think about what do we know how to do? With DOM programming, we know how to find an element in the DOM, and we know how to update its inner content or its inner HTML. So what I need is I need an inline element and another inline element so that everything is going to be displayed in one line. So we have a bunch of options of things that we could use, but what if we just use a, what if we use a span and another span here, like so. So I'm essentially wanting to have it work like so. By putting it in a span, it's now possible for me to reference this in my code. So how am I gonna get access to these two spans? Well, I need a way to identify this span. So I'm gonna give it an ID and I'm gonna say, this is the mouse X position and this is the ID equals mouse Y position. Let me just move this down so you can see it. Okay. So think about what we need to do. Our code needs to get access to this span and this span so that it can update it every time there's a mouse move event. So what's that gonna look like? So here in our mouse move event, let's say let mouse x equals query selector mouse x and let mouse y equals document dot query selector mouse y like so and instead of printing this out to the console let's say mouse x is equal to the event client x value and mouse y is equal to the event client y save that and come over here so that didn't work right how come that didn't work well what are we doing we are overwriting this object with whatever is in here it's not an error it's not an error but it's not what we want so actually i could show it to you if you want to see it happening if i put a breakpoint here and i remove the mouse you're going to see that mouse y after i step over this line mouse y is equal to a span now if i step over this and this line look at what mouse y is now now it's a number it's 24. so we've overwritten it that's not what we want to do so what do i want to do well i want to say mouse x dot inner text is equal to inner text is equal to Let's try that and I'll refresh this. So this time mouse Y is equal to that. I'm going to step over this, step over this, and you can see that mouse Y is still a span and the inner text is now 35. Let's get rid of this breakpoint and try again. So now you can see that as I move my mouse around, the DOM is updating in real time and now my web page is everything I built, all the static content that I built in HTML, but it's also taking into account what's happening with the user's computer. So you could imagine using the kinds of techniques that we're talking about here to build a game or to do something really interactive with the user. So you know when they click on things, you know when they move their mouse, where they move their mouse. You can load images on the fly, you can change content in the page. There's a lot of power here. So you are writing a, a series of functions and these functions are gonna get called in response to, um, in response to the, the user doing some, something in the page, okay? All right, I have another challenge for you. And that is, what about, um, right now we have a thousand URLs to dog images. 
but they're hidden. So the only way I can get through them is I can click on this image and go one by one. But what if we wanted to show the user all of these, all of these at once, okay? What if I put a button in here and if the user clicks on the button, I replace the button with a list of all of these. So let's make an, an ordered list with all of these as links that open up in a new page, okay? What would that look like? So let's put in a button and let's give this button an ID of more dogs. So now I have a button here to load more dogs. And let's also put in a, let's put in a div for dog URL list. I'm going to put in a div which is going to start out being empty. So this is the this is where this is where the dog URLs will go and clicking this will fill the URL list. So one item is, I have a, a button here. Currently it doesn't do anything. I click on it and nothing happens. And the other is a location where something is gonna get placed. So it's really common when you're building up your DOM and you're doing your static HTML web design for you to put in divs and spans and other containing elements which don't have anything in them when the page initially loads. But then in response to the user doing something, you're going to fill it up with whatever kind of content that you want to, you want to show the user. Okay, so let's, let's write the code for this. So I'm going to, um, I need to, first of all, I need, I need a click event for the button more dogs. So let's do that. So I'm going to say let more dogs button is equal to document.query selector more dogs. And I'm going to do a click handler. Let's do add event listener. So more dogs button dot add event listener. And when the user clicks on this, I want to call a function like so. So to begin with, what if we did this? What if we started out by just removing the button? So you can click the button once, but then once you've clicked it, it's not possible to click it again, okay? So one thing we could do is we could say, uh, I wanna take the more dogs button and I want to remove it from the DOM. I want it to disappear. Let's try that. So I come here, I click on the button, and the button is gone. So that part of it is working. If I load it again, the button is there. I click on the button, then the button is gone. So a lot of times when you're building event-driven interfaces like this, what you're gonna do is you're gonna either include or remove UI features that the user can or can't interact with. Like if it's not possible to click this button again, maybe I don't want the button, or maybe I wanna gray out the button or disable the button, or there's lots of different ways we could do this. But step one, we will um, remove the button from the DOM. Step two, we need to do some work. So what I'd like to do is I'd like to get the div that we created above so that we can start filling it up with things. So the div that we created above is called dog URL list. So that's our div. So I'm gonna say let div equals query selector and I'm gonna query for pound sign and then the name of the ID. Okay, so at this point I have my, my div. Let me show you what I wanna try and build. So I'm gonna mock this up so you can see it. So right now this div is empty, but what I really wanna do is I wanna put an ordered list in here, and then I wanna have a list item, 
And inside the list item, I want to have an a href equals whatever the URL is, and then whatever the URL is again. And I want to do this multiple times, okay? So this, let me just copy and paste this so that we can see it below. So we want to essentially do this and like so. So I, I need to build that in code, okay? So I already have the div. So the next step that I need is I need an ordered list. How do I create an ordered list? Create an ordered list is gonna be document.create element ordered list. So now I have an ordered list, but this ordered list hasn't been inserted into the page yet. It just exists in my program and that's fine. I don't have to do anything with it yet. Later on down here, I'm gonna to have to place it into the div. How do I take one element and put it inside of another element? I have to take the first element, my div, and I have to append a child element inside of this. So I'm gonna append child my ol like that. But my, uh, my ol is currently empty. So what do I have? I have an array of URLs, an array of strings. And what I want to do is I want to take a string that looks like this and I want to I want to take a, a, a something that looks like this and I want to turn it into something that looks like this and Bear with me for one second. Yeah, so I want something that looks like this. Hard to get it all on the screen, so let me just do this so you can see it. like that. That's what I need to build in code, okay? So what I need here is I need a way to go through my array of URLs, process each one of these, and then create it an li element, an anchor element, and stick it into, uh, stick it into my ordered list. All right, let's try and do this. So I have hounds. I'm gonna use a for each method on hounds. Hounds is an array. So I'm gonna loop through each element in the array. Each element in the array has a URL. So I can write this two ways. I don't know which way you're more comfortable with. So let's do it this way first. If, so if I have a URL and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna process each one of the URLs that I have in there. So let's think about the steps. What do I need to do? Step one, I need to create a list item. So let's do that. I'm gonna say let list item equals document dot create element list item. Second, I need an anchor element. Let anchor equal document dot create element anchor. So I now have the two elements that I need and I have to set them up so that they, they look the way that I want them to look. So I'm gonna say my anchor needs to have what? It needs to have an href. So I'm gonna say a href is equal to, and I need the URL that I'm currently processing from hounds. So I have that here in the argument to my function. So I'm gonna say equals the URL. I also need to put something that, I, that the user can click on, and 
I don't actually have a nice name for the hound, so I'm just gonna put the URL. So I'm gonna say a dot inner HTML is equal to URL. So the part that goes in between the opening and closing of the anchor tag, that inner content, I'm gonna make that equal to the URL. The last thing that I wanna do is when you click this link, I don't want it to open in the current page. I want it to open in a blank tab. So I'm gonna say that I want to open this in a target equals to underscore blank. So I'm gonna ask the browser to open this in a blank window or a blank tab, depending on how the browser um, processes these. Okay, so now I've got my anchor all set up. I've got my, my list item all, all finished. I need to put the anchor inside of the list item. So I'm gonna take my list item. I'm gonna append a child to the list item and the child that I'm gonna append is the newly created anchor element like so, okay? So now the list item is inside of the, sorry, the anchor is inside the list item. The last thing I need to do is I need to put this list item that we just built, it needs to go inside the ordered list. So I'm gonna say ordered list dot append, let me scroll this up, append, child li. Okay. Now, before, we, before, does it work? Let's save it and see if it works. So I click on more dogs and it works. I now have a thousand rows of dogs. If I click on one of these, it opens in a new tab. Perfect. This is exactly what I want. Okay. So let's just make sure we understand how this worked. Again, if I reload this page, it's going to, when I click on more dogs, it's going to fire this Let's just step through the code. So another trick you can use when you're when you're working on code like this, and if you want to if you want to step through this code, I could just throw in the the debugger keyword inside my code right here. That's the same as setting a breakpoint in um, your browser. So if your dev tools are open, when I save this and when this opens, when I click on this button, what it's going to do is it's going to drop me directly into the debugger at the line where my debugger statement is. You don't wanna leave debugger statements in, I mean, you don't wanna leave console.log statements in either. But when you're going quick and you're trying to understand why is this event not doing what I want or why is this code acting funny and you want to automatically get thrown into the debugger, you can use this as a technique to make it happen. Okay, so let's step through this code and see what's going on. So the first thing that's gonna happen is it's going to take this button and it's gonna remove it from the DOM. So after I click past this line of code, you can see that that element is gone. The next thing that's gonna happen is it's gonna go and find this div and it's gonna get a reference to it. So now it has a reference to the dog URL list, which is currently empty. So if we go over and look inside the body there is this div dog URL list, but it has nothing inside it. Next, it's going to create uh, it's going to create an ordered list. So I step over this. I now have an empty ordered list. OL. If I was to go here and type OL, you'd see that I just have I have an empty list. There's nothing inside it yet. It hasn't been filled with anything. So this is the heart of our code right here. I have the for each loop and what it's gonna do is it's gonna go through every one of the elements in this hounds array, one by one by one. It's gonna call this function for each one of them and every time it calls the function, it's gonna pass the element in the array as a variable called URL. So I'm just gonna set a breakpoint inside here on line 102 and I'll let my code run in there. So the first time it comes in, it has this very first 
URL, which you can see ending in 1003.jpg. So what's it going to do? It's going to create a list item. It's going to create an anchor. It's going to take this anchor and it's going to add an href, set the inner text and the target. And if I were to show you what this thing looks like right now, there's what the anchor that it has just built in memory looks like. It's got an href, it has a target equals blank, and it has this uh, inner, the inner content or the text that's going to be displayed is the URL as well. It's going to take this anchor and it's going to append it to the list item that we just created. So right now you'll see the list item looks like this, it's empty. After I run this line of code, if I do that again, the list item now has one element in it. It has an anchor element in it. So I'm slowly building up a new piece of the DOM. I'm building up another part of the DOM tree, but I'm doing it outside of the DOM. So none of this content is in the page yet. Like you can't see anything in the page. It's all happening in memory. And when I'm done, I'm going to attach it all to the real DOM and then we'll be able to see it. So the last thing that's going to happen in our function here is it's going to append this list item to our ordered list. So again, let me show you. The ordered list currently looks like this. It's empty. And remember that the list item currently looks like this. Okay. So what it's going to do, I'm going to step over this line of code. And if you, if I go back here and I show you what the ordered list looks like, you'll see that the ordered list now has a list item inside it with an anchor inside it and so on and so on. So if I let this run, every time that this runs, it's going to run twice, three times, four times, five times. I'm not going to go all 1000 times. And it's going to continue to go. And every time that it does, OL is going to get bigger. So if I, if I show you what OL looks like now, you can see that for every time that it's run, there's a new list item that's been added and the list item has an anchor and the anchor has all of the attributes that we set. So I'm going to um, let this code finish. And then when it's done, it's going to append this list item to the div, which is why you can see all of this content that's here. So we can, we can really easily modify the state of the page in response to an action from a user. And we can combine that with data and DOM nodes, and we can put it all together into really interesting ways. There's, there's one last thing that I want to show you before we wrap this up. And that is so far, everything we've done has really been in response to the browser doing something or it's been in response to the user doing something. But there's other categories of events that we can have happen too. And one of them is we can have things that happen based on timing. So let's, let's change our code a little bit. So we've already got code right here to handle the case of clicking on the dog. Whenever you click on the dog, it changes the image. That code is working. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to, I'm going to write another little piece of code here. I'm going to say, set timeout and I'm just going to copy this code so you can see what's going on here. And I'm going to say like so. Okay. So what did I just do? Set timeout takes a function that you want to call, so like an event listener, and it also takes an amount of time in milliseconds. So what it says is run this function, but don't run this function until 3000 milliseconds have gone by. Okay. So what should happen here is I'm going to, I'm also going to put a console log in here so you can see it happen. Uh, timeout complete running function. So I'm going to save this, go to my console and let's do it again. So one, two, three, and it happens. Timeout complete running function. And now it changes this. Now it doesn't happen again. Okay. 
So that's interesting. Uh, another thing we could do, so a set timeout is going to run this function after this many milliseconds and it's going to run it once. Okay. We could, however, we could modify this and we could say, I want to run this function every three seconds. Let's make it every two seconds. And sometimes um, when you're trying to think about this, you'll see people, they'll write their code like this. They'll say two times 1000. And what they mean is I want to, they want to think in terms of seconds, but they want to, but they need to make it into um, milliseconds. So they'll just, they'll multiply it out. So if I want this to run every two seconds, I want the um, interval to complete and I want it to run our function. Let's try this. So now we've got like very similar code, but instead of the user doing something to make this happen, we've got the we've got time taking care of it. So time is in charge of what's going on. So you've probably seen lots of websites like this where they'll have a carousel of images and the carousel will sort of rotate through a bunch of images. Really, really simple to do. You're just changing the source on an on an image element. And you can have those images that you want to display already queued up in an array or something like that. And this will just go on and on all the way through. I won't, again, I won't make you sit through a thousand of these. So that's a good place for us to, to wrap up. I would encourage you to make sure that you really feel confident with the material that's in the notes, because we're going to be using, you're going to, for the rest of your time doing, um, doing web programming, you're gonna do things with the DOM and DOM elements, querying for things, modifying elements in the DOM, and taking data like we did with the hounds array and turning that into something that you can visualize in the page. And you're also gonna do a ton of, of work with events. You're gonna write all of your code based on events that happen in the page or events that happen from devices or from the network or from APIs. There's all sorts of things that you're gonna be able, you're gonna to have to use this for. So this is a fundamental idea of web programming. And I would, this week in particular, I would really encourage you if, you, if you're struggling with any of these pieces, make sure you write them down and you, we can talk about them online. You can email me. Um, I wanna make sure you really feel comfortable with them and that you understand what's going on here. So you can try, try working on this, uh, this code yourself uh, if you wanna, you know, just, just to see if you can make it work. Anyway, I'll pause there and we'll carry on with this stuff again in, in uh, subsequent videos.